Good morning. Thank you. Now, there was a guy who was a senior at high school, and he was a brilliant athlete, top jock. And uh, one day, the school was playing a game, and one of the guys was sick and he couldn't come, last minute. So there was a sophomore boy who lived quite near the school. And they worked out that if this guy went to get his uniform, he could get back to the school and go on a 50-mile journey to play. Now, the, the sophomore guy wasn't going to do anything in the game. The game was called cricket. Let's not even go there. Uh, <laughs> let, don't, don't even think about it. But, uh, but the guy who was a sophomore was never going to do anything of use in the game, but he needed to make the numbers. So. The guy gets, the sophomore guy gets his uniform, they jump on the bus, they go to the game. But now he's blown away, right? Because he's in the team with the big guys at school. The king of sport at school, who is captain of the team, sits next to the sophomore. Sits by him on the bus because he doesn't know anybody. And he's really kind to him. They play the game, they win the game easily. The guy, the king of school, I mean, he was a man. He nearly had a beard. <laughs> He's the guy who sits by the sophomore all the way home. And he engages in conversation with the sophomore, and he, it's a Monday morning, Monday afternoon, and he says to the sophomore, what did you do at the weekend, just to make conversation? And the younger guy says, well, I played cricket on Saturday. This was the 70s. <laughs> 1970s, not the 1870s. He said, I played cricket on Saturday. Uh, and in the 70s in the UK, uh, no shops were opened ever. Uh, there was hardly anything on the television. And unless you went to church, there was nothing to do. And so the sophomore said, uh, he, he said, well, a Sunday, I, of course, I did nothing because my mum goes to church. But of course, I don't want to go to church because it's really dull. So I've stopped going to church. Uh, so it was a boring Sunday. What about you? He said to the senior. What did you do? He said, oh, on Saturday I played cricket. On Sunday I went to church. And at this moment, the sophomore looks at the senior and he drops in his estimation from being king of school. And he looks at the guy and he thinks to himself, oh my goodness, why on earth do you go to church? You are the best athlete in the city. What would somebody like you want to go to church for? And so, of course, he thought all these things, but actually what he said to the senior was, wow, why do you go to church? And the senior got a little bit red in the face, blushed a little bit, got slightly stuck for words and said, well, uh, I go to church because I follow Jesus. The sophomore said, wow, and turned away and didn't engage in further conversation and avoided the senior's gaze, even though it was probably a little bit rude to a senior guy at school. He got home that night, the senior, and his mum and dad said, how was the game? And he said, oh, it was good. And the parents said, well, it doesn't look like it was very good. And he said, well, uh, this sophomore guy, we had to take him because we were short of players, and I sat with him, and I tried to talk about Jesus and he said to his mom and dad, I've never done that before in my life. And I tried to say something at school to this guy. And his parents said, so why are you upset? He said, I was terrible. I really did it badly. And I know I put the guy off. And I know he wouldn't be interested ever again if he met a Christian. And when I said something to him, I thought, well, he must think I'm a good athlete. So if I'm kind to him and I say something, maybe. He, 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 but he said it was desperate. And it was an awkward silence. I don't think I'll ever try that again. The wonderful thing about Jesus, and you've got some notes on your hand out, the wonderful thing about Jesus is that he never surprises us in a bad way. Let me point that out to you by looking at Matthew's account of his life. Right at the beginning, now you've got to picture Matthew, okay? He knew Jesus. He was a follower of Jesus. He became a Christian, if you like, by meeting Jesus. 
And when Jesus was resurrected and gone back to heaven, Matthew wrote the gospel, one of the four accounts of his life. So you've got a picture of Matthew sitting at his Mac, <laughs> saying to himself, okay, now I saw all this, I was there, I watched it all, I know everything that happened from the day I met him. You know, like any writer, how will I construct the story? How will I take the, the story and make a book out of it? So what Matthew does is, right at the beginning, quite early on, he tells us what happens if we become followers of Jesus. If you would say this morning, oh, I don't believe it actually, I love my friend who I come with, or my neighbor, or my colleague, I like him or her, that's why I come, but I don't believe it really, I don't think so. This is great today, because I, I hope, because it'll get you to see what happens if somebody follows Jesus. So you know, no surprises, right? If you follow Jesus for a long time, here's a chance to remind yourself of what it looks like. Because kind of Sundays are for that, isn't it? You know, whatever's happened this week, here we are in the room. Start again, press the reset button. Another week. Look at what he says in chapter 4, verse 19, very early in his story. He quotes Jesus as saying this, Come and follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. He's speaking to fishermen. So clearly what he's saying to them is, You're a professional fisherman. If you follow me, he uses a metaphor, a picture, you will influence people with your skills. Just like you can fish, your skills will be used to influence other human beings. So he might have said, uh, if you're a school teacher, if you're a, a stay-at-home dad or mum, if you're a garbage collector, if you are a soccer player, he, whatever you are, he says, if you follow me, this is what will happen. I will use you, your personality and your talents, I will use that to help influence other people to think about me. So it's not very sophisticated. Is that okay? It's not sophisticated. He'll take you as you are, fisherman, and he'll help fishermen to influence other people. All right. Don't look for anything sophisticated in what I'm saying because there's nothing. Just take the words as they come. Right. Let's see how he ends the book. Here it is. If you've been to church a lot, you'll know the end of the book. This is the last few lines. So as he sat at his MacBook and said, how do I put the story together? What's Jesus' mission? What is he after? What does he want? What is the aim of the whole thing? He says this right at the end. He quotes Jesus as saying, therefore, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, says Jesus. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, I will be with you always to the very end of the age. That's the last few lines of the book. So when Jesus left this world, he said to the people we met right at the beginning of his working life, if you follow me, you'll influence people. At the end, he says, okay, here's the mission statement. Write it down, Matthew. Leave it for 2,000 years' time in North Coast. Here it is. I've got all the authority. He says, I've got the authority. Look, I beat death. <laughs> I've got authority. I've got all the authority. This is what, I, what I'm telling you guys. I'll be with you always, the last line. I will be with you always, even until the end of the age. I will never leave you, he says. This morning, if you follow Jesus, he says, I will never leave you. So what's your week look like, you might say? Well, he says, influence people. Make disciples. Help people to think about what it means to be a learner about Jesus. A disciple is a learner. If you follow Jesus, you are the best placed person in your neighborhood or work. To help people think, what would it look like to be a follower of Jesus? What do they look like? How do they live? How would I become a learner like this? Make disciples by doing three things. Going, baptizing, which means helping people to become learners and say they want to be a learner of Jesus and to say so in public, and teaching them to obey everything. Go on teaching the new learner about Jesus. Now, you might have been a Christian 50 years. I hope you feel like a learner. I hope you feel like you can learn more about yourself and about him. It's a lovely thing, isn't it? The senior at high school was closer to what Jesus wanted than he thought that day when he went home to his mum and dad. 
See, because the senior at high school, somewhere deep inside his slightly fearful journey on the bus, did this. He said, this guy's a sportsman, I'm a sportsman. Maybe I can somehow, because we share this love of sport, be some kind of influence on him. So he was kind of trying to make a disciple, and he did the first thing you do, which is to go. He didn't wait for me to come to his church. You know, if I was the sophomore, he wouldn't have said, come to my church. At first he said, I'll go and play sport with him, and I'll get to know him. That's what he did to the sophomore. He goes, and he tried to say something, I follow Jesus. I mean, he tried in the most naive way to say, let me help you to hear something about Jesus so that you could become a follower too. And in a sense, he was teaching me that you can follow Jesus. So he went home to his mom and dad and felt bad. But actually, that boy done good. Now, here's the plan. I hope it works because we've got to do it together because the Bible's the boss, right? Not the preacher. The Bible's the boss. So you've got to get your head in the Bible now. Here's the plan. I'm saying to you, think for yourself on this. When Matthew constructs the gospel, he doesn't surprise the reader. Follow me, I'll make you a fisher of people. You'll influence people if you follow me. No surprises. End of the book. I'm going. Go. And help people to become followers of mine. You lot, go. All right. Here's what we're going to spend today, and if you come back next week, next week. He puts on a training exercise, a practice he gives them a practice while he's still there. You know, because some people learn by listening. Most of us learn by doing, right? So he has a doing practice in chapter 10. It's really exciting, actually, because he kind of gives them some tuition and coaching. Today, before he takes them out onto the field to do it, which is Matthew 10, I'm going to take you to what he does in the locker room with a board and a pen and he says this to the disciples if in doubt when you try and pass on me to other people if in doubt I'm going to show you two things that you must never forget and when you panic when you think you're the worst at ever telling anyone anything about Jesus or showing anybody how to be a follower these are the two things you must recalibrate in your brain and reset when you're struggling when the, when the senior is struggling, he should press a button and reset two principles to get some equilibrium. I'm going to suggest to you, if you read this with me, the two principles. And then if you're around next week, we'll look at the practical training that he asks them to go out and try. Clear enough? All right. Let's look at the two principles that he gives them before they leave the room. Here they are. Number one. He shows them, as the head coach, if you like, his heart. He says, if you're going to go and try and help people to understand who I am and give them a chance to begin to become followers of mine, you need to know my heart really well as your leader. Let's look at his heart. It's amazing. When he saw the crowds, verse 36, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. So I've only got two principles for you. Verses 36 to 38. Here's the first one. What's Jesus' motive? When my senior friend would have been scared for getting it wrong, not knowing the answer, not knowing what to say if somebody made fun of him, feeling a bit embarrassed that he lost his temper last week in a game, and he might have been seen being... a poor human being who got cross. <laughs> what should my senior friend have said? He should have read this. And I should read it every day and say to myself, when I see the crowds, just have a look at 36, when I see the crowds as a follower of Jesus, you know what I feel? A bit of fear? A bit of not good enough? A bit of other people could influence people to think about Jesus, but not me. You know when Jesus sees a crowd? You know when he sees your workplace or your neighborhood or your family? You know when he sees your sports team or your drama group? When he sees your college friends? Do, do you know what he sees? Can you see it right there? He's telling us. When he sees a crowd, he has compassion on a crowd. Why? 
There it is. Because they are harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Sheep without a shepherd is a picture that would have been well known to the readers of this book. In the Old Testament, a guy called Ezekiel writes about Israel, the nation, without a leader when they turn their back on God. And he says they're like sheep without a shepherd. All of Ezekiel 34 is about this. Sheep without a shepherd. So Jesus says to them, do you remember from Saturday school when you learned about Ezekiel? Sheep without a shepherd? When I see a crowd, I see people mangled by the wolf. Harassed and helpless is as if the wolf has got to, peep, got to the sheep and ripped them and killed them. Now, friends, this can be really offensive if you say, well, I'm not a Christian, actually. I've come here and I find this quite offensive. Are you telling me that Jesus looks at me and says, it's as if your leader doesn't exist and you've been ripped apart inside and you have no leader? That's, doesn't that sound offensive? If it hasn't offended you already? But of course, the first thing any human being must do before they look out of the window to point to somebody else is look in the mirror and look at themselves, right? If there's even a hint in you this morning that part of you is harassed and helpless and leaderless sometimes, then it's probably an indicator that you understand the great leader himself. Because something in you says, but I've got a great leader who has all authority in heaven and on earth, and he will be with me always, even when I deeply screwed it up last week. And then when I badly get it wrong next week, he sees that I am without him harassed and helpless, and he's my leader. And he says to you today on a Sunday, if this is you and you follow him, hey, reset the button. Did I say I was with you sometimes when you have a good week? When you behave yourself, when you do well? Or did I say I'm with you always, good or bad, high or low? I'm with you always. Because I have compassion on you. Because I know you're harassed and helpless without a shepherd. That's what life has done to you. But I am the good shepherd. And I'm your savior. I have compassion on you. And I love you. And when you look in the mirror and say that to yourself, then you may just get a taste of how needy of Christ you are. You may just be so relieved that Christ loves you that something about your demeanor towards other people says plenty about what Jesus is like. Because, of course, there's a humility that goes with knowing that you're leaderless without Christ that will translate. And people will see a more humble woman, even in her failures. So that's what he's teaching here. He says, in the thick of life, in the midst of it all, press the reset, please. And it would change our lives if we realized that without Christ we're leaderless, but the leader will never let us go. So before he sends them out to try and live for him, he says, you've got to get this clear. Understand my motive. And then... Not just your words, but your demeanor and your behavior and the style of life that you are in company with other people will carry the DNA, the emotional DNA of what it is to have me as your leader when you don't deserve anything and I love you so much. It must spill into others' lives. I wish I could have told my senior friend that. I wish I could have told him a long time ago that his humility as a senior in being kind to a sophomore that his vulnerability in saying I follow Jesus was beautiful because he made himself look a little bit foolish in a secular culture which didn't go to church he humiliated himself a little bit and then worst of all the guy who he was talking to turned his back on him I wish I could have told him press the reset Press the reset. The very fact that you could behave like this meant that you were trying your very best to be a good at being a normal human being. Vulnerable, generous, reaching out to somebody, being willing to be a fool. You did good, man. You did good. But that's what he says to you if you want to be like this. 
because it's kind of scary thinking it could be you who's the one who goes, right? What have I got to offer? All right, that's the first thing that he says, don't leave the locker room without knowing this very well. So as we look at that, couple, that one line of scripture today, maybe that helps you to, on Thursday afternoon or Friday night next week or Tuesday, just press the reset. Oh man, here's me being harassed and helpless like a sheep without a shepherd. Lord, please, please, come on now. I know you're not gone anywhere. I've gone a long way from you, please. And he says, I'm with you always. What should we do? Let's start again. Press reset. All right, here's the second one. Jesus' theology of mission. Verses 37 to 38. Here's the second of the two principles that he doesn't want them to go out without. So I'm offering them to you in the locker room this morning. So that when we get out of here and move into life, when we get out of the locker room, we think these are good principles that the Lord Jesus taught me for my life. Here we go. His theology of mission. He said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest field. So you notice, you notice there, he calls the world a harvest. You see it? It's a picture, right? There's a lot of grain to be gathered in. He says to them, there are many, many people who I want to find and help to be my followers. Now, you and I might say, well, very good, Jesus. But uh, to be honest, I live in England and I get quite depressed. You may see there's a big harvest. I don't see it very much. Uh, so I'm kind of relieved here that he calls it a harvest because uh, I find it quite easy to get depressed at the task. You say, how are you getting on? I say, I'm all right, thanks. Uh, you know, I'm not exactly Billy Graham. Uh, how are you getting on? <laughs> you say, well, I'm all right, thanks. I'm not exactly Billy Graham either. Well, thank goodness the one who knows the most says it's a harvest. Because if he made a hundred million galaxies and I can't even make a meal, I think I know who's right. And it's not me. <laughs> so the harvest is plentiful. I don't need to be depressed. What's more? He sees it as an opportunity. Look at the lines that follow. These are his words. Matthew heard him say them. He says, the harvest is plentiful. Now you've got to picture him looking at his friends, right? And he, he looks straight at them and he says, um, but the workers are few. Now, you know when somebody says, looks at you and says, yeah, but we could do with some help. And they look at you. You know what they're saying, don't you? Can you help me? So he's looked at them and says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And then he drives it home. He says, ask the Lord of the harvest, guys, to send out workers into his harvest field. In other words, are you guys up for this? Like, there's a lot to do. I'm in charge. I know what's going to happen. I'll pull it off. But I need somebody to go on my behalf. Um, I've got loads of compassion. And I've got a plan. But, uh, will you go? And they say, well... <laughs> You know, I've got a busy week coming up. You know, I know it's Sunday morning now and I could think about going, but you know, I've got a meeting on Monday and I've got this on Tuesday and before you know it, it'll be Sunday again. I don't think I can go. And anyway, I'm not very good at it. Send one of the church staff. They'll be good at this. Don't send me. I mean, don't even know my life. Man, I've made a car wreck of so many things. Don't expect me to be the person who can help people to think about Jesus. He says, no, have a go. Now, how do you have a go? I'm 57, and when I was 38, um, I thought it would be a good idea to take my training budget from Christians in sport and from my church. And instead of going to a Christian conference, I thought I would spend it on going to a conference which was all about having a better life, a vibrant lifestyle, and all that, but it was nothing to do with Christianity. So I thought it'd be interesting to go and be on the receiving end because I spend my life saying to folks, think about Jesus. And say you're in a church like this, the chances are there are more people who follow Jesus than aren't in a room on a Sunday. So therefore, you're kind of in a majority. So I thought, what would it be like to go to something opposite? So I went. Now, I can't name it because they'd sue me. It's a global brand. So I went to the event. Uh, 150 people, limited places, small groups of eight, three days. So I got there, I sat down in my group of eight. My, my coach was called Wendy. I couldn't miss it. She had a badge that big. <laughs> Wendy. Wendy. 
I was sitting at one o'clock to Wendy. This was problematic because when we sat down, Wendy said, we're going to spend the next hour, we're just going to go around the group and we're going to say four things. Have we done this course before? What difference did it make? Two, where did you go to college? University. Three, what's your job? Oh, and number one, what's your name? What's your name? All right. So God, please don't start with me because I looked around the group. Nobody was older than 25. Nobody. Everybody was a model. Everybody. <laughs> all of them. Everybody. And then it got worse. Jemima. She went right, anti-clockwise. Jemima. Jemima. Jemima, tell me about yourself. Oh, hello. Sounded like the queen. <laughs> Jemima, hello. Uh, she said, no, oh, Jemima, have you done the course before? She said, oh, yes, changed my life. Changed my family's life. I told all my family about it. I brought them to the course. We've told the truth to each other. We've stopped lying about things that went on in the past. We've faced our demons. We've addressed them. We've talked. We've rebuilt our relationships. Wow, it's changed, it's changed our family's life. Thank you very much, Jemima. And where did you study? Oh, I went to Oxford, which is a very good university. Not as good as Cambridge, but it's a good university. I went to Oxford and I studied such and Oh, very good, Jemima. Uh, Jemima, where do you work? She said, oh, I work at uh, Coots Bank, which I, I, did, I should have checked the figures. I think you've got to have like 10 million pounds in your account to open an account at Coots Bank. Uh, I work for Coots Bank. I said, great. <laughs> uh, and by this point, I've forgotten what the last question was because I was so depressed because I knew what was going to happen. <laughs> so they just goes, okay, Jonathan, tell us about yourself. Uh, yes, I've done the course before, changed my life. I went to Cambridge. I work in the city of London for a multi-billion, trillion dollar company. He, honestly, six foot two, Blue eyes, oh, blonde, oh, for goodness sake. It's all the way around. Now, 45 minutes in, it comes to me. Oh, I know, thank you for groaning. Thank you so much. Oh, Flip, we're running out of time. Thank you for groaning. Groaning. Graham, tell us about yourself. Well, thank you very much, Wendy. My name's Graham. Uh, um, so, Graham, have you done the course before? Uh, no, I haven't actually, Wendy, but I'm very much looking forward to it because I think I can learn a lot from it. Uh, you know, you have to do that, don't you? you know, yeah. <laughs> so she said, very good. She said, so tell us where you studied. So I said, well, Wendy, I, I studied in Wales, actually. And she said, hmm. <laughs> so now I thought, well, I've got something on this one, Cambridge. Uh, so I said, uh, she said, where do you work? I said, well, I, um, I work in uh, Cambridge. She said, oh, very good. He said, what do you do in Cambridge? I said, well, I work in a church. And I thought, if I say in the middle of the university, that would sound good. So I said, right in the middle of the university. And she said, okay, let me stop you right there. She said, let me stop you right there. She looked at the rest of the group and she said, now. She said, Graham, could I ask how old you are? I said, yeah, I'm 38, Wendy. She looked at the group and she said, now. She said, friends, she said, just imagine if Graham had had somebody to tell him to come on this course 14 or 15 years ago, just imagine what a difference it could have made to his life. <laughs> I know, I know, I know, I know. She really did, she really did. So, so you know you've got to act on you. You've got, you know, it's a public place, this. So I, I say, and I've already said I'm a Christian. So I, I, know, I, say, uh, I say, well, Wendy, you know, I'm really looking forward to this. I'm going to learn so much over the next few days. But inside, inside... I was thinking, there's only 10 minutes to the break. The restrooms are down there. There's only one corridor from this area. Wendy's bound to go to the restroom because she's been talking for ages. Here's what I'll do. I'll walk behind her, then I'll kill her. <laughs> no, I mean, I know that's a bit mean. I, you know, I know that's a bit mean, right? I know that's a bit mean. I didn't. I didn't do that. But you know... Friends, I spent the next eight weeks, every Monday, we had a small group. We had to go into London to this small group, and Wendy was leading my small group, and she was the real deal. She really cared. She was genuine. She was a real... She wanted people to have a better lives. It was a brilliant course in its diagnosis of the human condition. Um, what's wrong with us? It was very good. But you know what Wendy's problem was? She was the Lord of the harvest. Let me explain. 
She was a brilliant coach, a brilliant teacher, and she could get people to see how they could make their lives better. But she thought it was her ability that pulled it off. She thought she could fix lives on her own. I want to put it to you that Jesus' second big principle is so important, it's scary. He thinks clearly, his theology of mission, he thinks really clearly about how it works. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest field. If you come to meet Christ, it's a supernatural miracle. You have to be born again. It's a miracle from heaven. Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not stop me. It's a miracle. He knows his sheep and he calls them by name. Nothing will stop him. He can't be stopped. And you know when we get most depressed about thinking we could be the one who makes a difference to somebody like that senior? Do you know when we get most depressed? I, I'm going to suggest something quite aggressive, really. I think it's about vanity. Wendy was the real deal, but there was a vanity there that was a bit scary. And I went home and I said to my friends, my wife, my friends, do you know what? I fear that when I stand up to talk about Jesus, it might sound as if I'm saying to people, if only you were a bit more intelligent or better educated or had a bit more money or a bit more emotional intelligence, maybe you could be a Christian too because I am, because obviously in all these ways I'm cleverer than you or a better parent than you or a... You know, maybe it's down to my skill that people I know are Christians. Well, you know what, Wendy? That's a great mistake because you're not the Lord of the harvest. Here's how it works. Jesus is the Lord of the harvest. And the two symptoms of vanity are opposites. Number one, despair. You might be here this morning. You say, I'm a Christian. Hey, I made a wreck of so many relationships and family and friends. Hardly anyone I know follows Jesus. Don't even begin to think I could do that. Don't even begin to. Sorry, to, please don't hear this too aggressively, but that's vanity, as if you're the Lord of the harvest. I wouldn't mind 10 bucks for everybody who's cried on my shoulder that says I've really blown it with my mum, dad, brother, sister, best friends, kids. I've really blown it. I wouldn't mind 10 bucks for every one of those conversations. And I'm not saying don't try hard. I'm not saying don't love. I'm not saying be reckless, but I am saying this. You can't open blind eyes. You really can't. You really can't. And it hurts bad when you can't. And there's people in all kinds of agony here because they wish they could. But my friend, don't blame yourself. Please be careful. Be careful because it's a symptom of vanity. Do you understand me? Please understand me. Please own it. Please own it. It's a balance, isn't it? There's none, you can't be reckless with people's lives and you need to love on people. But be, for goodness sake, you can't build a church and you can't make people born again. And you've got to stop that because it drives you crazy. It drives you crazy. And you think, I'll never be able to tell anyone about Jesus because I'm a loser. Stop it, please. Not many of us will be the other side of vanity, proud. <laughs> but you know what pride looks like, right? Well, I don't want to say too much about my church, but it's pretty good. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, yeah, the number of people who work with me are Christians. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, my family, let me introduce you to all my 15 kids. They're all brilliant. <laughs> Now, again, don't hear me being cynical. It is a marvelous thing when the Lord Jesus Christ opens the eyes of people we love dearly and deeply, and our lives are enriched by it, and we must rejoice in it always. You don't hear, please don't hear cynicism, please, on both parties. But I am saying this. The Lord Jesus says, when you're in the midst of life, and you think you can't be the one who influences people, and you cannot go and help people to learn about being a follower of Jesus, and you're not able to fish for people, you can't do it because you are a failure, because you blew it, and you deserve nothing, and you're lucky to be in, and the only people we should really listen to are the ones who've made a great success of the fishing work, where it matters most, where the people they love. Please hear me clearly. He says to his followers in this passage, I am the Lord of the harvest. We don't understand it. We can't run it. But he did make a hundred million galaxies. So I suspect he knows more than I do, even when my heart's broken. Right? Ah, good. I didn't mean to, yeah, I didn't mean to shout that. Because, no, because it's sensitive, right? It's sensitive stuff we're on here. All right. So here we are then. That's it. That's it. What we're trying to do over a couple of weeks, you know, end of the summer, into a new year in some ways with all the changes and school times and all that. Here we go. All the foreigners have left here, except me. Hey. 
here we are. If you follow me, I will help you to influence people. He beats death. He goes back to heaven. He says, go, go, influence people. Help them to meet me. Help teach them. Help. And then he says, let me give you a practice session, but come into my locker room first. Let's put the board up. It's two things you've got to know. You've got to know because it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard when you're on the field. <coughs> Here's the two things you've got to know. Number one, look in the mirror and see how much I love you. And then you'll have some compassion to give away. <coughs> Excuse me. You'll have some compassion to give away. Remember how much I love you. And that will flow out to other people. Number two, don't beat yourself up and don't be, ar don't be arrogant. I'm in charge. If it doesn't seem to work, I'm in charge. If it seems to work, I'm in charge. Just be humble. Just be humble. I'm the Lord of the harvest. Not you. Now he says to them, do you think you could try now? And they say, well, it doesn't sound so bad. It's a bit of a relief, actually. This. I think this could be me. Oh, um, we should stop. Brian, uh, let's have the musicians back because we're going to sing a song together that draws attention to the words that we've looked at here and so that you can have a think about it as you sing along together with each other. It's a nice way to close, isn't it? With obviously great musicians. But uh, there's one thing I forgot to tell you. You know the senior guy? Uh, let me just check the date. Yeah, it was 42 years ago, that senior the best sportsman at school. And 42 years ago, he spoke to that sophomore kid and went home and said to his mum and dad, I really blew it. I really blew it. You know what? I'm glad I lived near school. I'm glad somebody knocked on the door of my classroom and said, could you go and get your uniform? Because you're playing for the school today. I'm glad the king of school sat next to me. I'm glad he said to me, I follow Jesus. I'm glad that six years went by and I couldn't get out of my head that a brilliant athlete would even dare to demean himself to say he followed Jesus and look like a fool. 42 years later, you and me are in the same room, my friend. How many other people will be in heaven with us if you are willing to be the senior to some sophomore this week, knowing two things. He has compassion. And he is the Lord of the harvest. Who put you in this room? Who was the senior? Mum, dad, grand, friend, neighbor, brother, sister, child. Right? You're in the room. You're in the room. Oh, how blessed are you. Shall we stand and sing? Let's sing these words because they're beautiful and they reflect what we've done today. So let's sing together. <laughs>